Starting off with some of these early medieval grammarians and encyclopedists, I've got a couple here that are just examples for us. One of them is Martianus Capella, and then the other one is Priscian. People often read Priscian along with Donatus uh, because the two are so sort of connected at the hip in some ways. I don't see them connected at the hip that much, but certainly they're the most pr profound uh, or pr pr um, prominent uh, grammarians at the time. Let's focus first on Mar Martianus Capella, who's roughly a contemporary of Augustine himself. We don't really know his birth and death dates. We just know when he was writing, about 410 to 429. But he was a precursor of these guys in several ways. He writes The Marriage of Philology and Mercury, and that's our selection that we were looking at, which became the treatment of liberal education for the Middle Ages. This this uh, uh, particular treatise really outlines how you're supposed to educate people, and that stays pretty much the uh, the manual on how to do it, what what ought to be uh, studied and when and how and to what extent. Uh, he pretty much lays down the foundation or the railroad tracks for that, and it's followed fairly well. The trivium and quadrivium are what we're talking about here. This is an allegorical work. It's it's quintessentially medieval. Partly because it is allegorical. Uh, the Middle Ages, if you know anything about middle, medieval literature, loves allegory. And he also, through this allegory, is providing snippets of the classical rhetorical works, just like we were talking about in the previous slide. This guy is one of the very, very first to start doing that. Augustine's writing his own treatise. Marcianus Capella is doing what later medieval people would do, and that is to put together a kind of an encyclopedia, a snippets here, and, and uh, greatest hits kind of um, collage of previous material. And he's doing it for the express purpose of providing a, a manual for teaching. You know, that that's, that's clear, and Augustine's not really sort of doing it in the same way, but uh, he outlines the several liberal arts. Book five on rhetoric is about all of the past greats. Augustine, to his credit, and I don't want to honk his horn too much here, but it's clear I like Augustine a little bit more. I find him more interesting. Augustine is trying to do something that in his mind is new. Martianus Capella is clearly in his mind not trying to do, do something that is new. What he comes up with is something that's kind of new in that it is a, a sort of Reader's Digest version of rhetoric, and he's really kind of the first one to do that. But it's backward look, looking. It's synoptic. It's a summary of things rather than trying to break new ground. At least Augustine is trying to grapple with issues about, you know, theology and rhetoric, learning uh, in the new environment. Can we use these guys? Euhemerization, all that stuff. There's none of that in Martianus Capella. He's not the least bit interested in, in, in raising new questions that much. And in fact, he reduces much of rhetoric to style. Augustine does that to a great extent, too. That's going to be a theme of the Middle Ages, reducing rhetoric to largely style. Now with the grammarians, this was one of the important aspects as well. This is a small group of folks. You'll see them all the way from Priscian, uh, like I said, Donatus as well. They largely taught syntax and figures or figurae. Okay. Now remember that syntax deals with word order, what, what the what the um, what the ancients would call schemes. Okay, and figurae you would call tropes. Syntax is word order, right? Structuring a sentence a certain way so that it has a particular effect on the audience. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country, for example, is a scheme. Deals with syntax. But a figure is something like my love is like a red, red rose, right? A simile, for example, is a figure of speech, a trope. Um, neither his duodecim nor his institutio teach how to compose meaningful language. That's not what they're trying to do. They're analyzing, breaking it down, showing you how to create these little things, but not how to get at better meaning, just how to phrase things in a catchy way, in a, uh, in a clever way. Uh, notice how, it, how pro gumnasmata it is ish it is. It's very much like a like a handbook. It's it's a textbook really. It's here's how you march through. If you've ever read Holman's handbook of literary terms, it's a lot like that. You go look up and say, well, you know, here's a here's a, a doohickey and uh, tells you what it is, shows you what it is, and says, go and make a doohickey. Um, here's a um, uh, here's a simile. Tells you what it is, shows you what it is, go make a simile, right? Um, and so it, it's very formulaic. It's very kind of exercise-y, uh, that sort of thing. This view of grammar proved really too unwieldy by the later Middle Ages. So, so what these guys are doing is they're trying to reduce um, rhetoric down to sort of uh, grammar, syntax, uh, figurae, um, and uh, and and trying to trying to contain it all within within um, uh, a 
a, a fairly small vessel. What's going to happen in the later Middle Ages is people are going to realize that you can't really you can't really contain it into something like this. It's hard to keep all of what they're trying to do within one discipline because what they're really talking about isn't just grammar. It is rhetoric. It is, to some extent, logic as well. It is poetics or literary criticism. And so uh, what they're trying to do by confining it and putting it in a small little shoebox like this really didn't work very well. But we'll see that later on.